have shared the incommunicable experience of war. We have felt, we still feel, the passion of life to its top. In our youths, our hearts were touched with fire. Oliver Wendell Holmes. This is my interview with Grandpa. Okay. Where were you born? Lookout, Indiana, just seven miles south of Baseville. When? 1925, June the 20th. Where did you grow up at? The same place. <laughs> How many family members do you have? I had five brothers and three sisters. How old were you when you went into the war? Eighteen years old. I was drafted. To, got a letter and said, Greetings and salutations. Your friends and neighbors have selected you. <laughs> um. What year did you go into the war? 1943. Where were you stationed at? Well, I took a basic training and, or I first went to Fort Thomas, Kentucky, and then I went out to Fort Riley, Kansas, and took basic training in the horse cavalry. What was it like there? Make a part. Was it? What was it like there? It wasn't too bad. It was, it was a lot of. Getting up early in the morning and going to bed early. <laughs> <laughs> um, how were you affected by the war? Well, I, I was wounded twice. The first time I had 11 pieces of a hand grenade in me. And seven days later, I was back up fighting again. And then one month later, I got a sniper bullet through the hips. Did you get to see your family during the war? Did you get to see your family at all during the war? One time, when I was, uh, after I took basic training, we had a 14-day delay in a route furlough. Um, did you and your family write letters to each other? Did what? Did you write letters to each other, you and your family? Oh, yeah, yeah. Were any of your friends in the war with you? Well, there was a lot of my friends in it, but not in the same place I was. Okay, did they make it out alive? I think most of them did. How were you affected by the war? Well, I wound up uh, still doctoring, going to the hospital ever so often on account of the old war wounds and uh, wound up with a paralyzed leg and a bunch of other stuff. I was, How were you emotionally affected by the war? Well, I really don't think I was emotionally affected too much. I mean, I fought down, I might as well tell you this damn story. Said all these dumb questions. <laughs> after, after I finished basic training in the horse cavalry, then they shipped us out to California, where we took a ship south of the equator, out along South America, and then over to New Guinea. And there I joined the 112th Cavalry Regiment. And they was right in the middle of fighting in New Guinea. And I got there just about right in the middle of it. I was a BAR man that was Browning Automatic Rifle. Yeah, I went through New Guinea without a scratch. I mean, they had been shot at a, a bunch of times, but they never ever did hit. And then from the... New Guinea was the hell hole, I tell you that. Besides the mosquitoes and the swamps and the cotton-picking vegetation and all that other stuff, most of us wound up with malaria and a bunch of other jungle fever. And then from New Guinea, we went up on the Philippines to the island of Lady. Our outfit went in on the third wave. 
in there we went ahead and walked across the level rice paddies into the mountains and there we had to hunt them up and destroy them dynamite and uh, every once in a while, just about every other day, we was fighting them. And then we were trying to take a hill, and they were shooting down at us. And a hand grenade landed four foot from me. And when it went off, I had 11 pieces in me and knocked the wind out of me. I thought it was a dead duck. But then out of 124 of us, there was only 14 of us walked out of there. And then the next day they came in with airplanes and bombed the damn top of the hill off where they should have did in the first place. And then seven days after I was wounded, I was back up in the front again. And I didn't hardly know a soul in the outfit because most of them was killed. And then, that was on November the 20th, 1944, and then December the 20th, 1944, then a sniper got me. And then I wound up in the hospital for two and a half years. Get that bust of my pelvic bones and the first, and shot four inches of sciatic nerve out of one leg. And then, um, the first doctor to operate on me left a four by four pad in me, or what they call a sponge nowadays. And then I got infection in my pelvic bones and in my intestines. And then uh, they thought for a while I was going to die a couple times. And then I was so bad shape that instead of shipping me home on a ship, they had to fly me home. And then we landed out there in California, and then they, I went up to uh, eight major operations to get fixed up again that I could walk. Well, down in New Guinea, when we were fighting the chaps down there, then they made a banzai charge against the Grandma River, and it was laying three and four deep in there. And the first high water to come along washed them all down to the beach. And the Army engineers was down there, and they were drinking that water all the time before the before the bodies washed down the thing. And then when we got relieved, then we had to go ahead and go up to the front where there was a bunch of soldiers that was buried and we had to dig them up and it was wrapped up in ponchos with telephone wire wrapped around them. That telephone wire was just a rubberized wire. Then you'd dig them up till you went up and found the wire and then you pull them up and a lot of times the heads would fall out and the feet would fall out. And for three days afterward we couldn't eat anything or drink anything because everything smelled like dead bodies. We even had to burn our clothes. And then after we got back to just right before we moved up on the Philippines, then the Japs every once in a while wanted to infiltrate in and try to get the chow line. Of course they had a different uniform and how they get caught right away. And one time we went and fought the Australians for four hours before we knew who in the hell they were fighting. <laughs> and then we, like we talked to a few natives down there, and the one guy told us that a white man tasted better than the other man. And we didn't go ahead and uh, go up in the mountains on account there was cannibals up there the way we heard. And I wasn't out of the bed. And then another time when we was up on the Philippines, we was fighting on Aramok Road, and there was a tank there, a Japanese tank that was knocked out. 
and there was Japanese laying over the top of it. And we was walking past, and he was all swelled up. And I told the guy in front of me, I said, you better go ahead and go through the awful pass. Looks to me like he's going to bust. And by God, he did bust and got on the guy ahead of me. Then I heard, <coughs> I got warned up on the Philippines that we were taking a place from another outfit. <laughs> And they was moving back, and we took their place up there, and that's when I got wounded the second time. Then they took me back to a, a tent where the doctor had operated on 24 hours a day. And he was the guy that left the four, four pad in me, and then I got an infection in my pelvis. Bone. And then they moved us to a a tent someplace. Anyway, we was laying there in the tent. Well, more than they kept you pretty well doped up with morphine. I was kind of with busted pelvic bones and a four-inch hole in my leg on the left side. And, uh, I was in quite a bit of pain. So when I woke up in the morning, I felt something crawling all over me. <clears throat> and I lifted the blanket up. And here I was just covered with ants. And they worked four and a half hours with crop side and the tweezers, getting the ants out of this hole over on my leg and where they had just operated on my abdomen. And then uh, another time we had a <coughs> ward boy there that wasn't doing to take care of anybody. He said, all we want to do is some playing. And there was a urine bottle beside me, and that thing wasn't working. And I told that ward boy, that, or I guess you call him a ward boy, he was supposed to be a medic, that it wasn't working. And he said, oh, hell, all you guys want to do is complain all the time. There was an officer walking past the tent. And I yelled at him, come over. He came over, and I told him that that urine thing wasn't working. Now so he looked in here, he just put the wrong jug on it and said it the right way. Well, I mean, it's hard to explain to a bunch <laughs> actually what was going on. So when I told him the ward boy said all you want to do is complain, he pulled a 45 out. He said, you little bastard, he said, you take care of these guys or else going to use this 45 on you and send you up to the that damn front line where you see what these guys are going through once. And so after that, he was real good to us, you know. That. But then I was too sick to ship back on a ship because I dropped from 196 pounds down to 97 pounds. And you could count every bone in my body. And so they flew us back, and when we got up in the air, we had full quarantines while I was laying on a stretcher, but we took canteen of water along in case we got thirsty. And after we got up so high, the canteen sort of leaked. And the, guy, and the guy below me thought I was peeing on him. <laughs> but then we got back in California, and I was doped up so bad that the Red Cross came around and gave everybody a Coke. And they said I was talking out of my head and I didn't even get to drink a Coke. And we had breakfast and we had bacon and eggs and fresh milk. And all this other time we was living on C rations and K rations even when we was laying at the hospital about ready to die. And it tasted so damn good I could have cried. Then from California, I don't know exactly where we landed, but then they shipped me up to Chicago in Heinz Hospital, part of it, and part of it was Vaughn Hospital. And then 
I don't know how long I was there, and I had so many operations I'd lost count. And then they took us up to Battle Creek, Michigan, up to Fort Cost, Custer. And I was in the hospital up there, and then they operated on my leg, and they cut me from the knee all the way up to the center of my back because I had a four inch of sciatic nerve shot out and they tried to stretch that nerve together. I thought that it might heal up and I could use my leg again. But it didn't work that way. I laid for six weeks with a cast with that leg propped up. And then when they cut the cast off after six weeks, I didn't have enough strength in that leg to hold it up. So eventually I got out of bed and was walking on crutches He's trying to get that leg all straightened out, couldn't get her straightened out. Well, they sent me home on a 30-day furlough. Well, on a 30-day furlough, I ran into a bunch of guys I had went to school with. Some of them were back in the Army. We got pretty well jagged up. <laughs> well, if it all was good, they had a dance up there, and I don't know where it was exactly, but we had to go downstairs. I was walking downstairs, I tripped and fell. And the next day, my leg was straight out just as good as she is today. And then, finally in 1947, they discharged me with a medical discharge. So I got the combat infantryman badge, the purple heart, with Oakley Buster, that was. Ha, 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 ha.